you all so much. It's an honor and joy to be with you today as we begin this season of waiting and expectation of the, of the power of God to come, the power that has come and is coming again. And uh, I hope I can preach half as well as Bonnie Mason. <laughs> uh, Bonnie's a blessing uh, to us and to so many. Uh, for her faithfulness and dedication and illuminating the, the mission movement that uh, has spread around the world and is continuing to do so, and we're uh, deeply, deeply indebted to your friendship. Uh, we're in a very challenging text this morning. We're in Luke chapter 21, and we're at verse... 25, Luke chapter 21 at verse 25. It says this, Then there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and there will be anguish on the earth among nations bewildered by the roaring sea and waves. People will faint from fear and expectation of the things that are coming on the world because the celestial powers will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put out leaves, you can see for yourselves and recognize that summer is already near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, this generation certainly will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing drunkenness and the worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come on all who live on the face of the whole earth, but be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Let us pray. O Lord, speak through me and uh, even in spite of me. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. I've uh, titled this message, What Time Is It? What Time Is It? Uh, Last weekend, we were visiting my sister for Thanksgiving. I'm sure many of you, anybody go to your sister's house for Thanksgiving? (laughs) My sister is a type A, highly, highly scheduled and highly focused individual. She moved to London a year ago, so we got to fly over and see her in London. My parents gave us permission. Tickets were cheaper for us than for her, so Carrie and I went over. And um, because it's London, Uh, This time of year, the sun peeked out from behind the clouds for about 20 minutes, the very first day we were there, and the sun was never seen again, (laughs) never. It was cloudy, it was cold, the fog rolled in along the Thames River, and... uh, Shrouded all of the street lamps, shrouded all of the lights, shielded our eyes from the traffic because it was on the wrong side of the road anyway. 
Now, my sister, as I said, has only lived there a year. And she exclaimed, wow, I haven't seen it this bad oh, since last time this year. So she guessed it's a seasonal thing, this severity of fog. And she lives in a high-rise apartment building on the 18th floor, little place, gorgeous view. And she sees the river, and you can see St. Paul's Cathedral and Tower Bridge. It's really fascinating. And, And there was the night that we saw it, big and round rising in the sky, softly bathing the world in light. Yes, it was the light of the full moon welcoming the beginning of a new season and comforting to us that the light is always present even in the midst of the fog. Now, the season is upon us in earnest today as we celebrate this first day of Advent. And for some of us, it feels a bit like fog. Look outside. We can barely navigate the way forward amidst the onslaught of all of the holiday messages and all of the holiday music. I mean, you know, there have been decorations on the shelves at Lowe's since mid-October, right? Does that annoy anybody but me? Okay, thank you. I mean, we had this wonderful... I mean, did anybody sit for the parade last, last night? Did anybody go to the parade? Amen. Thank you for doing that. It was cold out there, and there were people setting up and sitting in chairs from about 2.30, I saw. Um. Advent this season is not Christmas. It's not Christmas yet. That's the point. It's the season of preparation, of waiting, of longing, of hoping for Christ's coming. It's a reminder that the light is present even in the midst of the fog. So today we're invited to await the coming of the Lord. We wait with the prophets of old, we pray in earnest, we travel with the magi who long to see the star of wonder, star of light, star of royal beauty, bright. It's during seasons like this that the church really is at her best, don't you think? It's our charge in this season, our task and our mission to show a different way forward, to speak with authority, to answer boldly that while the world may be a bit confused about what time it is, we are not confused about what time it is because we know the time that is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. It's been said that the purpose of the church is to show the world that it is not the church. Our text today from Luke's gospel is actually the assigned lectionary passage for this first Sunday of Advent. If you have Methodist friends or Lutheran friends or Catholic friends, chances are their minister is grappling with this text today. And since I'm a Baptist... I sort of didn't want to deal with this text. And it's because I read this text and didn't want to deal with it that I decided to deal with it. You know, couldn't I have just gotten Elizabeth and Zechariah, you know, little baby in the manger? No, we get Son of Man coming on the clouds with glory. It's too early, actually, to talk about preparing for the baby in the manger, it turns out. So we've got to deal with the Son of Man coming on the clouds. It's the paradox of the season because it's the paradox of the life of Jesus himself. In many ways, our faith is a paradox. The time that we're living in is a paradox. Paradox defined, of course, as a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. A paradox. 
The candles on this table actually represent, we have two of them on the table to represent Jesus, fully God, fully man. On the one hand, we have this little scene with the angels and the shepherds and the sweet little baby in the manger. Perhaps you've already gotten yours out and it's politely displayed in a corner of your home. My grandmother's house, we we had the little manger display and, and somehow... You know, there always seemed to be like a nutcracker stuck in there somewhere or, you know, the Santa with the Coke bottle. Anybody do that as a joke for your, your grandmother's house? Oh, that's what we did. And that's often what the season has become. Baby in the manger, politely tucked away in the corner. But we're invited to see a different time. We're invited into the paradox because on the other hand, we've got nations in anguish. It says in our text, the roaring and tossing of the sea, the time of redemption for those who are found watching and waiting for the resurrected and living Lord Jesus who has come to give us victory over sin and death and who is coming again to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will make everything right. So we live in this tension We walk this tightrope between Christ who is human and divine, between heaven and earth, between the now and the not yet, between God's longed for and prayed for coming into the world, his vindication of evil, and God's coming again. Ours is a space between heaven as we think it might be one day and earth as we know it is on this day, and we live in the tension, awaiting for the day when when heaven and earth will be made new, to resemble something more like the vision that, that John the Divine writes about in Revelation chapter 21, where it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first Heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, I'm well aware of another kind of tension between the present time, the now time, and the not yet time. Because, I mean, let's be honest, we don't really understand the second coming. I mean, do you? I come here and preach this sermon. I don't understand the second coming because it's mysterious. So we'd rather kind of shelve that and focus on the here and now. How do I apply the Bible to my life today? Amen? But then there are those who are so fascinated with the whole second coming end times thing. Anybody have a family member like this? So preoccupied with the future, end times prophecies, that they ignore the reality of today. They ignore the kingdom that has come in Jesus, who says in Mark 13 that no one knows the day or the hour. So we are to keep watch and stay alert. This is further made plain in our reading from Luke 21. Now, the fact of the matter is that the advent of Jesus, his appearing, his presence, transforms us. It redefines us. It transforms the world. It redefines the world. And it's worth looking for right now and tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that because it redefines our world. Future. It redefines our present. It redefines our past. Now, the prophets of old didn't know when the Messiah would come, but they watched and waited anyway. 
Many of them died before they saw Christ's coming. But they remained faithful and it came to pass. Now the disciples didn't understand what it meant when Jesus said that he must suffer. No one knew exactly how he would rise again. No one knew how he would ascend, as it says, the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power. But despite their arguing and their bickering and their hiding behind locked doors after the crucifixion, despite their inability to recognize the resurrected Christ when he came among them, they watched and they waited and it came to pass. Now, the same was true when Jesus spoke of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, a lot of what Jesus talks about here in these verses and in the verses just before this passage are Jesus' actual predictions about what would happen in the time of the early church when the temple was destroyed and the persecutions happened during the Roman Empire. No one knew when it would occur, but they watched and waited. And in that very generation, in AD 70, the temple was destroyed. It came to pass. Now, in each of these instances and so many more, the words of the prophets are fulfilled. I got to sing in a, a production of Handel's Messiah yesterday over at Fredericksburg Baptist. And, and there's this uh, really strong bass recitative from the Old Testament prophet Haggai, chapter 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while, while I once more will shake, and the bass soloist says, shake, like Handel wrote it, so we would all shake. Shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. All nations I will shake. And what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. It says, the silver is mine. <laughs> the gold is mine, declares the Lord. It says in Haggai, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. In this place I will grant peace. The glory of the present time, the glory of the coming of Jesus, the glory of the time, even when the temple has been destroyed, is greater than the time when that temple was adorned with silver and gold and the time when that temple was so beautiful because the temple really resides in the presence and the person of Jesus. And that presence and person of Jesus resides in every one of us. That's where he wants to grant peace. He wants to grant peace with us and in us and through us. Now, each time something is fulfilled, it is actually transformed. It says in Revelation, Behold, I am making all things new. Our understanding of God, someone who may have once seemed distant to us and far away to us is transformed in Jesus who makes God near to us. He's transformed the, the very presence of God. The temple, because he transformed it, has transformed the way that we think about our worship, our understanding of the cross, a tool of capital punishment is once and for all transformed by the person and work of Jesus. Now, it may be a, a paradox. It may seem absurd or contradictory, but upon further investigation, the cross and the resurrection and the ascension are proof that it is true. Somebody better say amen. Come on. Now, at each and every transformation in our life and in the life of the world, the heavens and the earth shake. Do you believe that every little bit of transformation in your life, that the heavens and the earth shake? They do. When we spend time in God's word, the powers and principalities are shaken. When we pray in earnest for Jesus to make things right in our life, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our community, the heavens and the earth are shaken. For it says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
and we must know what time it is. Remember that it is up to the church. It is up to us as those Jesus has called from darkness to light to declare what is and what is to come. Now, this is the culmination of the parable Jesus tells them. He says, I'm going to tell you a parable without knowing what time it is. True to Jesus' form, it's so practical and simple. It's based on the appearance of leaves on the trees. And for me, here at the beginning of dark December, I am so excited about the appearance of the leaves on the trees. Amen? I love nothing more than to watch and anticipate the budding of the leaves. We live right along the Rappahannock River, and I can see out my window Locks Island, and I love it when the little green things begin to peek out because I know that winter is passing and we're getting into yet another season. I'm a gardener. I love planting things. I love watching the way that things grow at the different times. I love planting And two years into our time in Fredericksburg, Carrie and I decided to plant, this is funny because it's in this passage, a fig tree. We planted a fig tree right in front of our house, right on the city-owned strip of land because the city wasn't maintaining it, so I had to mow it, so I said, let's take all the grass out and put a fig tree there. (laughs) We didn't fully understand it at that time, but the fig tree really has a special meaning. All throughout the ancient Near East, all throughout Scripture, there are all these references to fig trees. They symbolize rootedness, settledness, fruitfulness. And this is why Jesus talks about fig trees so often. So we began to think of this little fig tree as a statement for our life, as a statement for our ministry, as a statement to say, we are here, and no matter how hard it gets, we're staying. (laughs) We imagined passers-by, and we thought this would just take like a year or two, passers-by plucking the fruit of the tree and wondering how wonderful that would be to have our ripe and juicy little figs. But we didn't know that we would have to wait you research fig trees, and some of you are nodding your heads because you may have one, it takes three years for a fig tree to produce fruit. Three years. And that was true for our ministry. It was five years, two before the fig tree, and three with the fig tree for the ministry to begin bearing fruit, really. There were little fits and starts, but we had to wait for it because it wasn't the right time yet. I mean, early on this tree, we had to really take care of it. We had to prune it back and cover it up in the winter and uncover it to make sure it didn't die. I mean, fig trees are special. I think this is why Jesus points it out is because they're, they're the they're last to bud and they're the first to lose their leaves. I mean, you have to pay special attention to these trees. Now, none of this happened on my time. The ripening of the fruit, not on my time. I had to watch for its time. I had to be ready. I had to be alert. There were times where I wanted to give up on the ministry and on my tree. But there is something that happens to us when we commit to waiting. And in the watching and the waiting, something that happens, something happens to us. And sometimes I think I'm just preparing for it, but it's preparing me. So allow the season to prepare you. Allow the season to make you more attentive, attentive to the soil, attentive to the needs around you, attentive to what really needs to be trimmed (laughs) in your life. This is what is true when we watch and we wait for the power of Jesus. Now, this generation, it says, will not pass away until all these things have taken place. What does that mean? It's a puzzling declaration. On the one hand, this is true. A literal read suggests that the resurrection and ascension of Jesus occurred in that generation. 
the temple was destroyed in that generation. But several scholars, including Joel Green and N.T. Wright and others, suggest a much deeper meaning to this turn of phrase, this generation. It might also mean that there will always be a generation, always be a category of people who are resistant to the waiting, who are resistant to the power of God. This generation will always be with us. We have to contend with it. Just like we have to contend with the, the good fruit coming up among the, the thorns. This generation will always be with us. It will not pass away, but God's words will never pass away either. So just like I have, a, I have to plan for the possibility that my fig tree will face, face frost in late spring, I've got to live in the tension that while some want to watch and wait, others will grow impatient with the waiting. A lot of people want the fig tree to bear the fruit right now. They want to go their own way. And I, and I can't force you to be patient. I can't force anybody to be patient. I can't impose my will. All I can do is wait and be faithful and pray. Maybe provide a gentle word of correction at the very right time as I notice the little buds coming out. Because sometimes that's how it is with people. You just notice the little bud and you, you coax it into a greater fullness. See, we do our best work when we help cultivate environments that allow trees to sprout and leaves to grow in the right time. We do this all the time. Our ministry over at the center, across from UMW, we even have a fig tree on our logo. I'm sure you do that kind of cultivation around here. Too. So this season, stay awake, be watchful, be vigilant. Go against the temptation to let the fog overtake you, to go blindly through the motions. This is no time to be on autopilot. Watch and wait. Study the scriptures and pray. And as you do, ask God what's in it for you and what he wants you to do about it. When you do, the powers will be shaken. And you will be one step closer to the kind of transformation we will all see one day when we face the Son of Man and everything will be made right. Amen and amen.